Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to a discussion of Michelle Alexander's seminal volume, The New Jim Crow. I'm Tish Kalimer, Community Engagement Manager at the Gail Borden Public Library here in Elgin. And I just want to go over a, a few little housekeeping things. Um, please mute your volume if you haven't already. And if you would like to make any comments or ask questions, please use the Q&A. And uh, Reverend Denise Tracy is going to be monitoring the Q&A for any questions that will be discussed or answered uh, after our two main, our, after our speakers have um, answered a, a few questions. I would like to thank the sponsors of today's program and indeed uh, our other programs in this series. CERL, the Coalition of Elgin's Religious Leaders, the Elgin Cultural Arts Commission, the Elgin Human Relations Commission, Gail Borden Public Library, the Fox Valley Citizens for Peace and Justice, and the Kane County Sheriff's Office. So without further ado, I would like to hand things over to former ECC sociology instructor, Joyce Fountain. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here and I will introduce some very important people. The first one I'm sure that many of us know and appreciate is our mayor, Dave Captain. I learned recently that he has lived in Elgin his entire life. Um, I also learned that he was a chemist for over 30 years and um, we know him as our mayor, but he, prior to that, he served on the uh, Elgin City Council. He was brave enough then to take on the role of mayor and I think before much longer, he's gonna say, forget all that stuff. <laughs> uh, secondly, Dave. Thank you very much, Joyce. Okay, um, next I would like to uh, introduce another guest. This is someone else that many people know. Ron has served as in law enforcement for over 22 years, has been credited with hundreds of major criminal arrests he has worked in varying capacities to include narcotics officer, canine handler, SWAT team leader, and develop, implemented, and supervised the Sheriff's Office criminal interdiction team. Ron is nationally recognized expert in interstate criminal and terrorist interdiction. Ron has received five materia, excuse me, mer meritorious service awards and two deputy of the year awards for several successful mayor criminal investigations. He was also twice nominated by the Moose Kane County Officer <laughs> of the Year Award. Ron received the nationally presented Relentless Award in 2013 for his work in criminal interdiction. In his career, Ron has seized over 4,000 pounds of dangerous drugs and over 3 million in illicit currency, along with hundreds, hundreds of illegally possessed firearms associated with those crimes. Ron was elected Kane County Sheriff in November 2018, and his team immediately implemented employment diversion programs into the jail, along with medically assisted treatment to support and redirect inmates with drug addiction issues. Sheriff Haynes' focus is to take a zero tolerance approach to drug trafficking while providing positive life paths for the incarcerated and addicted in an effort to drive down recidivism and crime rates. Welcome. And a other special guest that we have is Professor Vincent Gaddis. He holds a PhD in history from Northern Illinois University with over 20 years of teaching experience in higher ed. He is currently professor of history at Benedictine University. He is the author of Herbert Hoover, Unemployment and the Public Sphere, A Conceptual History, 1919 to 1933. He is currently working on his next book, Revolution in Values, Why America Must Embrace the Beloved Community. Dr. Gaddis writes and researches on issues of race, class, and social justice 
and is a frequent workshop presenter and facilitator on these issues. He has served on the African American Employment Adv Advisory Council for the state of Illinois and currently serves on the City of Aurora's Human Relations Commission, the Advisory Board of Northern Illinois Jobs with Justice, the African American Family Commission, and is an ordained minister serving at River Valley Community Church in Aurora. He is married to his beautiful bride, Kathy, has two sons, Lewis and Clinton, and two grandchildren, Grace, Marie, and Lewis II. Um, so to you also, we say welcome. And I guess I'm just going to jump in here. And the first question I'm going to ask is oh, going to- no, Joyce, Joyce, we need to have the mayor welcome us first. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Thank you. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, to all the sponsors for uh, uh, bringing us together today. And this is, a, to me, it's a continuing discussion that we've had in Elgin for over five years on policing, racism, and transparency. Uh, we continue to learn from each other. We've uh, discussions today and future discussions should be both an opportunity to talk about issues and ask questions, but also an opportunity to tell your story. And I really believe that's a way that we connect with each other. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Black African uh, uh, portion of the city of Elgin came uh, to Elgin right during the Civil War. And uh, they called contrabands, moved to Elgin, came in a freight car, and uh, or Ernie uh, Broadnax uh, eloquently explained the, the history of African Americans in the city of Elgin. And what Elgin is, is a diverse community of uh, many, many different people. One of the most diverse communities in the entire country. And when I talk about telling your story, it brings us together. And I like to use this example. And I have a great many friends in the Lao community in the city of Elgin. And uh, one of them told me a story a few years ago about why they came to Elgin and how they came here. And he said, Dave, we left, uh, we had to uh, run out of Vietnam. They were going to, uh, uh, after the Vietnam War and what was happening in that country. And he said, my wife and I uh, swam the Mekong River with all our possessions. Our possessions included the clothes on our back and our infant child in a bucket. To me, that said a lot about the Lao community and why they came here. I think those kind of stories tie us together and they make us bring, they, they bring us together and share stories. So today's an opportunity for you to ask questions and to share your story if you feel inclined. I think it's an opportunity for all of us as part of a continuing discussion on racism and policing that's gonna go on in our city uh, throughout this year. Uh, again, thank you all for being here and listening to us. I'm going to turn it back to Tish, and I believe we have a, a video or a short video to watch. Jim Crow was a system of, of laws, policies, and customs um, that operated to discriminate against African Americans um, in virtually every aspect of social, political, and economic life. Well, ask yourself if some of the rules and laws governing felons today kind of remind you of a bygone era. Denial of the right to vote, right? 47 states in the District of Columbia deny prisoners the right to vote. But that's just the tip of the iceberg because in the United States, pretty much the only country in the world that denies people the right to vote once they've been released from prison in many states. Uh, in fact, uh, about one out of four African-American men have been permanently disenfranchised in a few states as a result of felon disenfranchisement laws. And nationwide, the figure is about one in seven. 
employment discrimination. Employment discrimination perfectly legal once you're branded a felon, right? Job applications ranging from Burger King clerk to accountant, got the box. Yeah, got to check that box if you've ever been convicted of a felony. Thousands of professional licenses are off limits to people who are labeled felons. In some states, you can't even get a license to be a barber if you've been convicted of a felony, right? Housing discrimination, perfectly legal. You know, back in the Jim Crow era, it was the era of rest racially restrictive covenants, right? Well, today, you can be discriminated against on the basis of your criminal history. In fact, public housing is off limits to you for a minimum of five years. Minimum of five years if you've been convicted of a felony. So here you are, newly released from prison, right? No money, no job. Public housing is off limits to you. Private landlords are free to discriminate against you. And you know, your mother, aunt, sister, girlfriend who lives in public housing, well, she risks eviction by housing you, allowing you to stay, to stay in the apartment, right? So what are these folks to do? No job, can't find a place to stay, right? What are they expected to do? Well, they're actually expected to pay thousands of dollars in fees and fines. Following the collapse of slavery, you know, black men were routinely arrested for you know, extremely minor crimes like loitering or vagrancy, right? They were arrested and sent to work on plantations through a program known as kind of convict leasing, right? The idea was that they had to earn their freedom, but the catch was they could never earn enough to pay back the costs of their shelter and their food and their clothing, and so they remained in perpetual servitude, a system that um, you know, some have called worse than slavery, right? Well, today we have a similar system. Um, even if a former prisoner manages to get a job, you know, you're one of the lucky few who manages to get a job, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished to pay back the cost of your imprisonment, to pay back fees, fines, and court costs, to pay back accumulated child support while you were in prison. So here you're one of the lucky few, you get a job, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished what is the system designed to do? Right? Put you right back in prison. In fact, that is what happens about 70% of the time. Within three years, 70% of released prisoners are returned. And in fact, the majority of those who are returned are returned within a few months. Because the hurdles, the barriers, you're just making it on the outside are so extreme. Public benefits. Don't expect even to be fed if you have a drug felony. Discrimination is perfectly legal against those who've been labeled felons and public benefits. In fact, if you're a drug felon, you're ineligible for food stamps for the rest of your life, thanks to President Clinton. Even if you're a pregnant woman, someone with HIV or AIDS, basic food stamps off limits to you for the rest of your life. Exclusion from jury service. You know, of course, one of the hallmarks of the Jim Crow, of the Jim Crow era were, were the all-white juries, you know, particularly in the South. Well, today, those labeled felons are automatically considered ineligible for jury service. In some areas of the country, you know, the all-white jury has come roaring back because such a large percentage of the African-American community is deemed ineligible for jury service. Now get this, even if you haven't been branded a felon yet, if you have negative experiences with law enforcement, that disqualifies you from serving on the jury if it might lead you to be you know, impartial in a criminal case. So good luck. You know, in many communities of color, finding someone who has not yet had a negative experience with law enforcement that just might justify your exclusion from a jury. But as bad as all the formal barriers, you know, to political, economic, and social exclusion are, as bad as all these formal barriers are, in my experience, many people labeled criminals find the stigma the hardest to bear. You know, it's not just the denial of the job, but the look that 
flashes across to an employer's face when he sees the box has been checked. It's not just the denial of housing, but being a grown man having to beg your grandma for a place to sleep at night because nowhere else will take you in. Thank you. Quite enlightening. And uh, because we have um, folks who are steeped in this area, we're going to rely on them a lot just to get insights and, and their experiences. Um, Ron, and if it's okay, I'll start with you. Um, the book, which has got quite a bit of publicity, uh, many of us have read it. Um, how has the book impacted you as well as the Kane County um, that you work in? Yeah, so thank you for that. And Joyce, I appreciate the intro. Um, obviously, uh, the book has direct impact on the Kane County Jail. And really, Kane County Jail, uh, which uh, I'm in charge of being the custodian of by uh, state statute, uh, reflects county jails and prison systems across the United States. So when I took over as sheriff, I, I had never worked in, in the jail before. I was always a, a police officer, as you heard from my bio. And, and a lot of my work in law enforcement kind of flies against um, uh, chapter two uh, of the book, which uh, I hope I have a chance to get into a little bit uh, as we talk further. But I always knew that we did very little here to truly correct people who are who were in our facility and it was just a revolving door. We had recidivism as high as 60% out of the Kane County Jail um, to the point of Ms. Alexander about, uh, you know, you're, you're back into custody within just a few short months. Um, so it was a priority of mine to, you know, get in at a ground level of the jail, have a real understanding of what is occurring in there and of course implement programs that help people uh, adjust their lives. Knowing that as much as 87% of all people in custody, and I, I truly believe it's higher, but that's a national statistic, 87% of all people in custody have some sort of addiction issue uh, that is tying them to their, their criminal culture or, or connecting them to a higher frequency of contacts with law enforcement. So um, addiction treatment, medically assisted treatment for the opioid defendant, defendant was a, a high priority of mine. Uh, when I took over as sheriff, as well as lack of opportunity training. So I believe people come into custody down one of three routes, and it's mental health is one, addiction is the other, and then the third being lack of opportunity. And that's simply, you know, growing up in an environment where you do not have that support, um, where, where you don't have proper mentorship, parenting, guidance, and, and you quickly fall into the cycle of, of gang life and narcotic trafficking. Um, so, so again, that lack of opportunity channel was very important when it came to jobs programs and, and even running job fairs inside of our jail. So uh, what I was really shocked to see when I, again, got involved at a very low level uh, in uh, running our jail is the extreme racial disparity, which, uh, you know, again, reflects across the United States and county jails and, and prison systems. And uh, this is just a, a snapshot. I'm going to share my screen here of uh, a presentation that we do called Humanizing the Incarcerated. And again, this book inspires that presentation from a local level. So of course we talked about, um, and folks, I'm sorry if the uh, video screens uh, have positioned themselves where it kind of blocks this graph, you can always grab the top of your, uh, your video bar if it's doing the same thing to you. Um, so you can move it out of the way to see the graph. But of course the book talks about uh, the war on drugs and how that dramatically increased the incarceration rates. And you see when that war on drugs uh, came into effect during the Ronald Reagan presidency uh, from 1980 to 1988, you see that incredible spike in imprisonment. And, and it's an often common phrase that we're 5% of the world's population and 30% of the world's incarcerated population. And that truly shows us how we, we got to that point. We talk about that racial disparity uh, that the book talks about, that I talk about frequently in the community here uh, with, within jails. And you see how Blacks are disproportionately affected even by cannabis possession. And uh, you, you see how the rates are so far skewed from, from white to Black in this graph uh, since 2001, uh, even to 2010. Of course, cannabis laws have changed here in Illinois. However, uh, usage rates and how it affects people in the criminal justice system 
still has a lasting and dramatic impact, especially when we talk about criminal history and how, how bonds are assessed um, when people do come into custody. And hopefully we get to talk a little bit about the elimination of cash bail in the new police reform bill. But you see uh, another example here of uh, black arrest rates when it comes to cannabis possession and Cook County is just a second one down there. Um, but again, you know, that's, that's reflected uh, in Kane County, DuPage County, the Northeastern region uh, of Illinois, of course, and, and across our nation. And then when we dial down into Kane County's population out in the community, so 6% black population from North to South in Kane. And like I said, when I became sheriff, I was absolutely shocked to realize that we have an average, this is an average jail population for a year, and this is 2019 stats, 2020 uh, is the same, but 37% black in custody in our jail, held on very high bond amounts. We're talking about uh, you know, two or three gram heroin possessions, and they're being held on half a million dollar bonds. So, and, and the reason for that is, the excuse for that is, it's their criminal history. So we have to give these people high bonds. Otherwise, they're going to go back out there and they're very likely to reoffend. So we're just going to keep them in custody in a warehouse. But, you know, when I see a 40-year-old black man um, sitting in here on a half a million dollar bond because he possessed three grams of heroin, only because he's got a few felony arrests in his background, um, he's excelling through programming in the jail. He's a high performer. He's really uh, embraced uh, his issues. He's learned how to work through them, but there is just a, a brick wall when it comes to release and return. So the only answer in the current justice system is send him away to the Department of Corrections and he'll learn his lesson for, uh, for six to 10 years. Meanwhile, that's lives lost. That's, uh, you know, disconnection from his family. Uh, literally, you know, this, this breaks at my heart when I walk through our jail and I see this over and over again when it comes to our population. So that's why I speak out on it, uh, Joyce, uh, not to pontificate forever, but uh, this is a, an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, judges have been shocked to see the sheriff actually coming into court to testify on behalf of defendants, uh, most of whom have been uh, black males who are performing at a high level within our jail programming that I do suggest uh, release to the community to allow them to work through our exit programming and get them employment and continue with their addiction counseling. And, and allow them to, to, continue, to continue their success. Um, this is, you know, when it comes to how this book affects life in our jail, uh, it's, it's a mindset shift. Uh, not really a mindset shift by me, I've already embraced it, but a mindset shift for the staff. And one of the most recent quotes that I got from um, a couple of our diversion officers that work in these programs is, Sheriff, when you came in, about 10% uh, of corrections officers really embraced and, and uh, appreciated what you're trying to do here for our detainees. Uh, now, two years into it, you're running right around 60 to 70% of our staff really embrace and appreciate what you're trying to do and, and, and improve the relationships between those in uniform and those in custody. So uh, that's hopefully a, a good summary and, and not too long of an answer uh, of, of how this is affecting life inside the King County Jail. Ron, it's Denise. We have a question um, from Dave Daubert. Um, are marijuana usage rates comparable across black and white populations? So as the book suggests, yes, that uh, even white uh, people abuse narcotics and, and cannabis even more than blacks do. Um, when we talk about the Kane County population right here, you have 50%, 57% white in our community, 6% black. So even by numbers in Kane County, drug usage is going to be higher among whites than, than blacks, just by, by, by sheer uh, populace. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow. I think many of us are aware of that, uh, pieces of that, but to hear it again all in one presentation, it, it, it never ceases to be staggering. And um, as the mother of two black sons and a black grandson, these are the kinds of things that keep me awake at night. Um, realizing that it's not just a matter of their behavior. It's a matter of who they are. Um, Vince, would you like to share something with us? 
Well, sure. Why don't Why don't we just begin with a kind of um, a fifty thousand foot view uh, of the title of the book, uh, the Ju the new Jim Crow. Um, for those who uh, have not read the book or are not familiar with this term, Jim Crow is a term initiated after the Civil War uh, to discuss the re uh, the segregation of blacks, primarily in the South, but an, a, uh, cementing a racist attitude that is that is national. What do I mean? Slavery was a system to create a racial caste system. Slaves were seen as property. They did not have political rights. They had no economic rights. They had no human rights. At the, then we fought a civil war over the issue of slavery. After the civil war, we had a period called reconstruction where the nation attempted to deal with the fundamental issue of race and its impact. That effort, many would argue, failed, although it did end up getting us, you know, for a short period of time, right? The two black senators, that feat was not repeated until 1992 that we would have an African-American sit in the Senate. We didn't have an African-American male sit in the Senate between 1876, Hiram Revels, and 2004, uh, Barack Obama. So during Reconstruction, there was this very short window of economic and mostly political rights that were afforded to African Americans. But a backlash started almost immediately. 1865, the formation of the Ku Klux Klan in Tennessee. Um, black codes all written all over the South. And these black codes were meant, as the video suggested, to take African Americans and criminalize them because if you could criminalize them, you could take their rights away. One of the Reconstruction Amendments is the 13th Amendment, and I will read it. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So written into the organic law of the land in the 13th Amendment is that, yes, we abolish slavery, but slavery in effect is legal as a conviction of a crime. You do not have the same constitutional rights. Now, what happened? By 1876, the nation was tired of this experiment in pushing forward for full equality of the freedmen. In the disputed election of 1876, a compromise was reached which would allow uh, Rutherford B. Hayes to become the president of the United States. And in that compromise, the Freedmen's Bureau, which had been the main federal um, uh, arbiter of court protections, voting protections, uh, distributed 21 million meals, established over a thousand public schools, established 10 H, what we call today HBCUs, um, that shut down and what emerged is what we call Jim Crow. In other words, legal segregation between the races, and that was formalized through the Supreme Court decision of Plessy Ferguson 1896 that said as long as facilities are separate, they can be equal as long as they are, let me use the precise legal language, substantially equal whatever that means. So substantially, so one drinking fountain with air cooled filtered water that says whites only and one drinking fountain with lead and no filter at all, colored. And that 
characterized the law of the South, putting people into second class citizenship. Now, Alexander's argument, and I, and I agree with it, is that what has happened in the late 20th and early 21st centuries is that after the civil rights movement and we got the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, the nation had been awakened to, to this issue that there should be you know, greater gains in civil rights. Well, the system of Jim Crow did not disappear, it morphed and it morphed into mass incarceration. And so the courts and our policies have been um, created to maintain a permanent black underclass, or shall I say caste, where a population is now targeted by our laws, then uh, strapped with what we call a felony conviction and then stripped away of the ability to gain resources and opportunity, in essence, being convicted today puts you still in the category from the 13th Amendment, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment of a crime. That's where those who are convicted are. Now, let, let me just say two more things about this and then, and then we can get into the discussion more particulars, which is this. Number one, the way that this new Jim Crow works is that we don't use the word race to talk about Jim Crow. So that to the general mind, we just saw in uh, the last several months leading up to this election and, and after the murder of George Floyd, we saw the whole mantra of law and order, right? And Nixon brings this in, that law and order, states' rights, uh, small government, um, individual responsibility, these become code language for what Ibrahim X. Kendi would call racist policy. And so Nixon begins this law and order mantra. Then we have Reagan say no to drugs, then Clinton and the crime bill of 94. And there is an explosion in the prison population. And let's not be fools. We live in a capitalist nation. The private prison industry was capitalizing off of the incarceration of black bodies. Rural communities were profiting off of the incarceration of black bodies because when the census was taken, those who were incarcerated counted in terms of body count to the county in which they were incarcerated, not the county of their home address. So public resources and so on, appropriations, congressional seats, all of that were being determined off of census data that was taking those who were incarcerated, denying them the ability uh, from a counting perspective to be counted with their home um, where their home was, but to be counted to give more benefit to the very com areas, towns, communities that were incarcerating them. Then we denied them the right to vote, uh, certainly while they were incarcerated, but in 15 states, uh, as Michelle uh, pointed to, once you have a felony conviction, you are denied the vote completely. And so what have we done? We've created a situation that Orlando Patterson calls social death, right? Civic death. So when you become incarcerated, you get a felony record, right? When you get out, the society has the ability to deny you political, economic, and social opportunity for the rest of your life. That is civic death. Now, we've got 2.1 million people in prison, 7.3 million if you take into account probation and parole. And so 
you know, African Americans are 15% of the population and 49% of the prison population. So what is happening? You have a large percentage of people who are African American who have been in the criminal justice system, many of whom have had to take pleas for guilty pleas to get out of jail so they could provide for their families. 86% of all incarcerated are nonviolent drug offenders, and we have sentenced them to civic social death. We've segregated them and created a permanent black underclass, which is mediated through their felony conviction. And so we have to, as a country, uh, come to a place where we confront this racist policy confront the, the emasculation of the Fourth Amendment that is part of perpetuating this, um, this system of segregation and oppression and begin to build ourselves into uh, something that looks much more like a nation that is based in fairness, equality, where in fact we do live out our creed that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaddis. Um, Ron, there's, there are several questions um, for you. Um, I'm wondering, um, I, I'm hoping you're still there. Uh, so there you are. Yep, I'm still here. I was just <laughs> We have people in the in the chat going, did he leave? Yeah, um, <laughs> All right. So, so yeah. there are, there are several questions here. Um, and one is um, the new Jim in the new Jim Crow, Alexander talks about the high rates of drug convictions that are responsible for mass incarcerations, where violent crimes account for a very small um, per percentage of convictions. Alexander states that drug convictions account for nearly 61% of prison expansion. She said, uh, uh, Matthew Thomas says that on page 126. Knowing this, what is the reasoning behind the zero tolerance policy for drug tra trafficking? And do you believe it contributes to mass incarceration? So look, all of my policy reflects on local issues. And when I say local issues, I mean specific to Kane County. Um, Anywhere from 90 to 95 percent of our violent crime in Kane County is somehow connected to narcotic activity, mm. um, whether it's people under the influence committing violent crimes or violent crimes occurring around drug trafficking. Now, look, when people come into custody, and this is why I love the new uh, elimination of, of cash bail proposed in the, uh, the new police reform bill. Um, but what the police reform bill dramatically lacks, well, one of the many things it dramatically lacks is conversation uh, or, or uh, text about what needs to happen for correctional reform. It is completely absent in, in the reform bill. So while a judge can remand somebody into my custody, that could still be just simply warehousing that person for who knows how long until their trial takes place. Um, that person needs to be triaged and needs to be cared for down one of those three pathways. And so if we do have a zero tolerance approach to narcotic trafficking, but then we have a holistic approach that treats the individual involved in that activity, that's how we drive down recidivism. That's how we drive down our violent crime rates as well. Um, I, I did, if you don't mind, I'm going to dice through just a couple of the questions that are here. I know we took care of the, uh, the marijuana usage. Um, how sure, does, go ahead. I'm sorry. I said, sure, go ahead. Yeah. yeah so how there's, does, there's one on the difference between Cook and Kane County. Yeah, because that one uh, cannabis usage uh, slide showed Cook County being so disproportionate in uh, black arrest rates. So obviously Cook, neighbors came right next to Elgin uh, on the, the northeastern border of our county. And anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of my jail population comes from Cook County as well. So, um, you know, we have a very transient population in northeastern uh, Illinois. When I say transient, you know, people come to Kane from Cook and people from Kane go to Cook. Uh, on a daily basis. So it's, you know, crime and uh, population does not stop at the border. So that's why I say it, it directly re reflects uh, Cook County here in Kane. And Kane County is home to the second biggest city in the state and the sixth or seventh biggest city in the state 
uh, in Elgin, whatever the, the current uh, census says. So um, just- can, uh, you, can you answer the question about the flag that's in back of you? The I question is, more, why yeah. is there a Blue Lives Matter flag in the background in a discussion about the civil rights movement that yes. those flag bearers majority oppose? Yeah, that is a, a question I often get about that flag. So that is a thin blue line flag, just like uh, firefighters have the red line flag, dispatchers have the yellow line flag. Uh, it's just pride in our very noble profession. It is not a police life matter flag. Okay, thank you. Can, can I jump in on that for a second? Please. Be, because the I think the questioner, and, and I quite right, that flag initially was created as a flag that was to honor officers who had fallen in the line of duty, if I'm correct, right? Yes. Uh -huh. um, but what has happened is that this, as many other symbols in, in other times and other contexts, the symbol has been co-opted by, uh, I, I'm just going to, you know, y'all can like me or not, I don't really care. It's been been co-opted by really the white Christian nationalist right that somehow that flag somehow it has been it has been co-opted to be a flag that is opposed to civil rights opposed to uh, the constitutional expression of uh, peaceful protest and brought into uh, or taken into a context of meaning, I'm I am with the alt right. So so uh, you know we need to understand the context. So that I, and I can just say personally that flag has been there longer than the current, you know, Sarah. troubles, right? Uh, but it is a legitimate question because it is a symbol that we saw in the insurrection two weeks ago. And so we, we do need to be clear about our symbols, where they come from, what they mean, and how they are being used or co-opted. Now there's a question, um, Ron, I think this is uh, for you, but it, 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 either of you, was there any effort to let county sheriffs across the Midwest know about, um, oh, this presentation and could this, be possible for my county or area. I don't know. Uh, so I think that somebody, I, I think, I know that there are people on this call from Joliet and Park Forest. So um, the, it was, the invitation went out pretty wide. I thought that was asking something else. Question for the both of you, what can we do as individuals to see systemic change more than part, just participating in discussions? Yeah, great, so great you, question. What do, need, what do you need from us? Sure. So, so I'll take this one first. I know, I know, Sheriff Hain has has several um, uh, suggestions on this, as as I know Dr. Fountain does as well, because we want her wisdom in this conversation. So I'll be brief and say this: Number one, you need to call your representative your state senator, your state representative, your city council person, and you need to make them aware that you support HB 3653, the police reform bill in Illinois. That's number one. Number two, you need to get involved in your municipality. You need, if you're in Elgin, you need to write a letter, make a phone call, send an email, and talk to Mayor Captain and ask him, what are the rules, regulations, policies, and so on in Elgin in terms of our police department? We need to get involved with civic organizations, NAACP, League of Women's Voters, um, you know, Cyril, whatever, and hold our uh, officials who work for us and hold them accountable. Um, and those are the ways that we begin this. And I would also say that wherever my computer does that, at whatever sphere of influence you are in, so at your school, at your job, at your wherever you work, you must be the vocal champion of civil rights and to call out racism every single place you see it 
and in a way that invites people to want to change the structure of racism. It's not easy and it's not gonna happen overnight, but it does take all of us. Sheriff Payne? Yeah, I know that question was from my good friend Marjorie and she's very active in the Aurora community and she is not just part of discussions, but she appears all the time. She uh, integrates with, with all groups, mm -hmm. all races, and she advocates uh, with true empathy and true passion. And that's really where it all starts for any citizen. Um, I agree with Dr. Gaddis, uh, be very vocal with your legislators. Um, and, and I'll give this brief example. So I agree with many, many parts of how the new House Bill 3653. I also disagree with many, many parts and, and how politically it was pushed through in a lame duck session with zero conversation with law enforcement leadership. Um, I find that to be very egregious and I have communicated that with our legislators as well. Um, it, I am happy to hear that there is a trailer bill that's coming uh, to try and remedy a lot of the issues within the bill, but uh, I, I still am holding out any hope that uh, you know, there's, there's any balance within it. Um, and, and everything, it all comes down to that word right there, balance. Um, everything that we talk, to, talk about has to have balance. To me, chapter two of this book, to bring it back to why we're all here, um, lacks balance when it discusses law enforcement. Um, and, and the reason why I'm passionate about that, you know, just, just pulling certain phrases like uh, asking for consent to search with hands on their revolvers, as the police do, uh, talking about pretextual stops in a, in a manner that is not actually uh, factual when it comes to a pretextual stop, uh, imagined drug crimes, quote unquote, uh, just shortly below that. that that's, that's an imbalanced uh, framing of, again, the very noble profession of law enforcement, and I get very passionate about that. Um, you know, we are billed as the ghost faced stormtroopers of the government in so many fashions. And that builds into a lot of the antagonism, a lot of the misunderstanding, a lot of the mistrust. Um, and that's why, you know, I have balance in advocating for, you know, the, the poor uh, people that are held inside my facility. I'm ridiculous bond amounts and I'm more than happy to walk into a courtroom and lose friends and police and prosecutors over it because that's a human being. I am also very passionate about advocating for the extremely brave men and women who put this uniform on every single day, leave their families and go out and protect and serve, uh, not knowing if they're gonna go home, especially in this climate, uh, if they're gonna go home to their families at the end of the day. We've seen violent crime through the roof in 2020. We've seen a, a massive disregard for the law and law enforcement in 2020, bleeding into 2021. And you know, I, I'm going to be a passionate, again, I keep using that word, passionate advocate uh, for the bravery that we see um, in, in the people that believe in the true meaning of this flag that go out and protect and serve uh, our community without implicit bias and with total empathy. Well, I, I, I gotta push back a little bit on that. Um, because the because when we look at that chapter, I don't think number one, I don't think there's any question about the uh, what the war on drugs intent was. I don't think there's any question that the war on drugs required the ability for law enforcement to have more caprice to do what the war on drugs was asking it to do, which was, which was to over-police and lock people up. I don't think there's any discussion that it, it is true that the United States government has allowed the militarization of the police. I don't think there's any discussion, whether it's U, US v. Reese or other cases, that the Fourth Amendment has been eviscerated to allow law enforcement to arrest, detain, search individuals with a end goal of arrest and then putting people in a system where most of the time they're forced to plead because of the whole bail situation. So, so I, I you know, it, look, law enforcement as an institution is the, um, they are the messengers, right? They're the executioners. And I don't mean that in the, I don't mean that in an 18th century with a hood over his head with a big ax. I mean that in the sense that if you're going to build a system of mass incarceration, 
what is the institution that must be pivotal in making sure that the raw material of incarceration is there and the raw material of mass incarceration are black bodies and so you create and uh, uh, extol or uh, allow or build up the ability of law enforcement to abuse other people's rights to eviscerate their ability to say no. And we clearly recognize, I don't think there's any argument, we clearly have seen with vivid display that while not all police officers are racist or all police officers uh, get uh, put on a badge so that they can exercise their their macho fantasies. There are racists, white nationalists, and those who do not mind exercising that authority, especially when it comes to policing black bodies. And we saw it in Minneapolis. We've seen it in many other jurisdictions. So, so while Alexander, in your mind, may be, you know, heavy-handed, I think it's no question. Law enforcement, if you know, if we it, law enforcement bears a lot of responsibility in this equation of mass incarceration. You're absolutely right. And, and we're not speaking about modern law enforcement. We're not speaking about Northeastern Illinois law enforcement that is very well trained, uh, recorded uh, on, on cameras constantly, subject to court hearings on a, a daily, weekly basis when it comes to criminal trials. That's where we're held accountable. Um, everything that we do in modern law enforcement is recorded. And there are strict and heavy standards if there is malpractice, any uh, inference of, of racism, any inference of bias. Um, the, the, the balance, again, is what we all have to achieve. The balance is here in Northeastern Illinois. So when we speak in generalities, um, and, and she talks about voting in that video, she talks about jury exclusion, she talks about employment and checking the boxes, none of that is relevant where we are. You can vote if you have a felony in Illinois. You can be excluded from a jury if you're a police officer. Um, I've been kicked out of two juries just simply because I'm a cop, because I'm gonna have a biased viewpoint. So again, it's balance. If, if you've been involved in the criminal justice system, a jury, uh, or you can be excluded from a jury by the prosecution, defense, or, or the judge. Uh, employment, we have over 30 employers now in Kane County that directly connect with the sheriff's office to employ people coming out of our jail. Uh, because we believe employment is, is one of the strongest pillars uh, and foundations to, to starting a new life after custody. Um, so we can't just paint with this broad sweeping brush that, uh, you know, what, what happens in uh, that ridiculous case in Minneapolis that sparked all of the civil unrest, even here in Kane County, applies to our local law enforcement. Um, the hate has to stop. Law enforcement stopped the hate um, here locally, for sure. And the community needs to respect and appreciate what our, our men and women do in that uniform on a daily basis. Uh, there, are two, there are two questions that are asked and um, uh, Mayor Captain, I don't know if you're still there, but somebody wants to know what the three of you think. Um, and I, I, there are two questions and I wanna read them both. One is from Janet Casey and she asks to the mayor and the police chief, when racism is built into the foundation of our systems, education, healthcare, justice, and housing, where do you suggest we start um, as a heal, not as just healing, but to resolve the conditions which lead themselves um, to the, the um, school to jailhouse pipeline? And related to that, um, Daniel Henson says, Vince and Ron, what can individuals and communities do on the front end to prevent justice involvement and on the back end for re-entry supports. It's really asking about the entire system of the community. And I think each of you have a handle on a piece of that. So I don't know who wants to go first, but. The mayor here still? Yep, he's, he's there. Yeah, okay. 
I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we've done in our, our history uh, dealing with uh, policing and racism goes back to Ferguson, uh, Missouri and the issues there. And we had a first community meeting after the Martin Luther King breakfast that very next uh, uh, year in January and started to talk about the issues. And I think that's made a change in our community. And uh, we all feel that we're part of a, we are part of the problem. We also have to be part of the solution and uh, open it up, have discussions about that. And, you know, I'm a story guy and we went back and we went, uh, uh, we had a couple hundred people show up at Second Baptist Church to talk about just the basics of what it, what it means to be a police officer. We had black police officers come in and talk about how they make an arrest, how we deal with people, how a young person, and this was the key to me, and I, and I really had a fear of this. I don't want a young person to be shot because they tried to reach into their console to get their cell phone to call their mother that they'd been, that they'd been stopped for a traffic. So how do we deal with that as a, as a community is through education and being able to do things like this and explain these things in positions to, to each other, have these discussions. And when people of different races can sit down and talk about a problem and how to resolve it from all the different angles, I think that's a way for us to move forward. Um, let me just interject. Uh, this is Joyce. Um, I am not presenting this as a simple answer, but it is vital to solution. I understand and agree. I am um, well aware of the historical that leads us to the um, prison. I don't even know quite how to describe it. This, this awful thing out there that I know many of us uh, family members, mothers are petrified um, because we never know who we and or our children will come into contact with. And absolutely, absolutely the system of policing must be um, changed. But I also wanna say, um, very often people want to know what can we do? Well, I think what we have to do and should do very honestly is not wait till young people are driving cars, but our racism has been um, started years before. And so it's kind of um, unlikely to expect if a young child has been raised, raised in a racist, uh, environment that is never challenged, that is never questioned. What do kids do? They emulate adults. And so um, certainly what happens to an individual educationally as a result of being in the prison system, we, we can look at the impact of that in our, in our young people in our community from that point. Remember, our kids and ourselves are going on uh, pre-learned behavior. Um, and so we see racism everywhere. And on, it's interesting that sometimes folks are more willing to address with the structural things than the personal things. Um, I recently retired uh, teaching sociology and obviously human behavior and race is certainly a part of that. And I had a course called Race and Ethnic Relations. And early on, one of the things I did with students was just hand out a card and ask them to complete it. And it simply said, Mexicans are, Jewish are, Blacks are, and um, down that line, and most of the time, uh, the um, one group that a lot of students had trouble with uh, was Asians. Uh, there was a lot of, of repetition there. Um, so Asians got the, uh, the reputation of being smart, but Blacks and Latinos, all those negative things, um, uh, 
blacks are gangbangers and um, all those uh, other negative uh, connotations, unless we authentically, and we being the collective and hopefully some of what we do on this level can uh, lessen some of the things that happen in um, the prison system, but they all have to go on um, simultaneously. I got to tell you folks, uh, the idea that this new generation is equal minded and does not um, come from place of strong bias is, is not real. And those same young people will find themselves in the police department, in the education uh, arena, and all of those other places. Absolutely, um, as a mother of two black sons, yeah, um, uh, and my sons are, are bona fide adults, but we still have those conversations. There are still places that we cannot go. Um, uh, so we need to look on it, not just at the uh, far end, but look at it from every perspective. Um, and I'm not asking anybody to confess anything, but think about who do your kids play with? Who do your kids invite home? Who do you um, uh, spend time? Are, what do kids think about uh, whether or not parents want different kinds of kids to come to the house? Uh, Anderson Cooper did a major uh, rewrite of the um, black and brown example. And today, kids are still racially focused and um, it has to be part of it. And so I challenge all of us, uh, before we can talk to and about other folks, what are our values? What do we believe? And those behaviors will be manifested as we interact with other folks. Kind of off topic, but critically important. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we recognize all of the problems and there are many um, and um, are systemic, but also our attitudes, our values and beliefs are systemic also. Well, let me just go back to Vincent Ron um, and uh, what can individuals and communities do on the front end to prevent justice involvement and on the back end for re-entry supports? In other words, what can we do to help change the world and change ourselves? Um. Well, let me give the let me give an individual answer and an instant. You know, part of this is that we're giving it, we're trying to give individual answers, and I agree with these individual positions, and we're going to talk about that. But we are dealing with structures, okay? We're dealing with structures, and until those structures are dealt with, we continue to fight at an individual level, but, but the, the, the structures have to change. For example, I can read, you wanna keep your child, uh, give your child a better opportunity to not land in the school to prison pipeline, read to your child every day. But if that child goes to school in a zip code where their resources are limited, high teacher turnover, not a lot of resources, that's going to be more difficult. So yes, there's an individual answer. Make sure you feed your children clean, nutritious food every day that they never are hungry. But the truth is institutionally, we live within a context where one out of five children is gonna to go to bed hungry tonight. So yes, there are individual things we can do. Read to your child, make sure they get to school, teach them to be honest, blah, blah, blah. All those things we all say we all value. But I'm, I'm just, uh, okay, you know, whatever. I'm just tired, okay? Because yes, no one on this call is going to say that I teach my child to lie and hate other people. Okay, fine. If you are living within a structural system that is that is based and executing racist policy, we have to be conscious enough to confront that reality. 
And enough of us have to be conscious enough about it to have the willingness to confront those realities collectively. Otherwise, it's not going to change. I applaud Sheriff Hain and the work that he's doing in the jail and the, the programs that, that he's uh, put forward and, and his visible commitment to members in, in the community. But Ron isn't going to be the sheriff forever. And the person who becomes the sheriff after Ron might say, you know what? Incarceration is about punishment and get rid of everything that he's done. So we can't just be satisfied with, well, I love everybody. We have to critique, get involved to change the structure. Because without that, our individual efforts are well-intentioned. <laughs> but 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 if we don't change the structure, we, we're we're continuing to fight the same battle generation after generation after generation. And it just morphs to a new, uh, you know, some kind of new form of prejudice. Thank you very much. And I, and, you know, and I mean, I'm trying to be hopeful. Okay, I'm trying to be hopeful. But know. Uh, <laughs> but it's you know, just, we we got to get off. Oh well, I'm not a racist. Well, I didn't own slaves. Well, my, you know, we got to get out of that crap. Yeah. I know. We live in a racist society that has institutions that are driven by racist policy, and we must confront that, period. So, uh, Ron, do you have a, 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 another response, or should we move to another question? You know what? I, Dr. Fountain, Dr. Gaddis, uh, just incredible, well-based, well-experienced responses. Um, I do just want to kind of take this opportunity uh, to, to jump off of how you get involved. Uh, it's, it's like Dr. Gaddis said, you're a parent, you're a mentor. Um, even if you're not, not a parent, you can still impact people's lives around you. And this is the topic that needs to be uh, shouted on constantly to remind people that yes, implicit bias does still exist. Racism does still exist. Um, I, I just wanna point out a couple of different questions here that have come through, uh, you know, it, talking about the, the gentleman who says, how can you say, uh, implicit bias doesn't exist in Northeastern Illinois law enforcement because of how many times their friend has been pulled over and they're black versus how many times they've been pulled over and they're white. Um, it sounds like that's an Elgin police issue. Again, you need to report that to Elgin police, a very professional progressive organization and they will thoroughly investigate that and, and determine if there is some sort of implicit bias occurring. Um, if there is some sort of uh, latent racism occurring. Uh, that's, and I'm sure Mayor Kaplan would thoroughly agree with me that uh, their chief and their, their, their police administration there is uh, absolutely incredible and progressive. Um, there's a comment about uh, how my statement regarding lack of involvement uh, by law enforcement leadership in House Bill 3653 is disingenuous and false. Um, you know, hearing from, yes, this statement is exactly right. There are hundreds of hours of committee and subcommittee hearings on the topic of police accountability and criminal justice reforms. But when it came to crafting the legislation specifically, no, um, you know, even from our director of uh, the Illinois Sheriff's Association, who is our statewide voice, um, to myself, who reached out to all of our legislators here in Kane and only heard back from about 40% of them to have a conversation about the bill. Um, I'm sorry, you, you gotta have us at the table when we, we uh, create laws. And I am all about justice system reform but uh, hasty is, is not the way to do this. Um, and, and the question about, do we support the Black Lives Matter movement? I just gotta throw something up here. Uh, and, and this goes to my point also about, uh, you know, the, the, the police taking the brunt of the concern. This was a sign that I held at multiple protests back in June uh, over uh, you know, the, the George Floyd incident and my call here is to point out, much like House Bill 3653, and there is not enough media attention to the fact that the police reform is just one of four pillars that the Black Caucus launched. There's education, there's socioeconomic reform, and um, I'm, I'm forgetting the third one as I talk quickly here. But uh, again, my sign calls towards the justice system and society in general to stop creating a culture where Black and brown people 
are kept in low income areas uh, that are deprived of the same education, that are deprived of the same opportunities as many others, only to result in a life of, uh, you know, in, in the black market because they realize that they don't have many other opportunities. It's, it's culturally accepted to them. And, and these are conversations that I have with inmates. Again, I am invested in our inmate population on almost daily basis and have face-to-face -face conversations with these people in my custody. So this is not me reading a book. This is not me making things up. This is me actually investing in people at the lowest point of their lives to understand why they're in my jail. And I hope they never come back again and do everything I can to make sure they don't come back again. And when I put all these names on that sign, and I'm the only police officer that is brave enough to walk into that crowd in uniform and hold up a sign that aligns with them, yes, I know what Black Lives Matter means. It does not mean anti-law enforcement to me. It means that race right now needs the most help and support of any others by disparity. And all I have to do is point to our jail population, 6% black in Kane County, and we lock up 37 to as high as 46% of, of my jail population is black. That's all I have to say to summarize all of this and, and to point to where the real issues are. It all has to come through corrections. It all has to come through societal reform before we ever bring balance and equality to this issue. Ron, there's a question here from, some, uh, from Matthew Thomas. And he says, you mentioned that you take a holistic, holistic approach to reduce recidivism. What does that approach look like? And are you aware that education within jails and prisons, especially college education, is one of the most successful methods in ending recidivism? So uh, would, you, would you tell us about um, some of, I mean, I've been in the jail and I have seen, I, I was there when you were getting your hair cut by uh, somebody who was learning to, to um, you know, cut hair. But I know there are all kinds of programs so that people can move from the jail to, could you tell us more about that? Yeah, again, without taking up too much time, it's, it's triaging people down one of those three pathways that they typically have interaction with law enforcement and face criminal charges and enter the criminal justice system. So I'll start with the mental health side. So we had to create a mental health cell block here in the jail. And the whole point of that was it's, it's a softer environment. Uh, we trained, when I took over as sheriff, we came up with a curriculum that certified 22 of our corrections officers as, as mental health officers. So those mental health officers work directly inside that cell, uh, cell block with our uh, psychology staff. And then we have an exit programming uh, system built with AID on the south end and Ecker Center on the north end. As people re-enter the community, we ensure that there's a handoff. So they're not just walking back out without that support. So for mental health, that's our, our holistic step. Uh, when it goes, and, and I could talk a little bit more on that. Again, I just, I respect everybody's time. Uh, on the addiction side, we created the recovery cell block, the recovery pod. That again has a much softer feel to it. And the jail is designed um, under our system to, to flow into recovery pod. That's the golden zone that everybody wants to get through after uh, successfully passing through uh, several uh, programs uh, in some of the other cell blocks. So in recovery pod, it's, it's our Cadillac of addiction treatment. It's uh, brought in by Lighthouse Recovery in St. Charles. I can't say enough about Nate Lantern and Lighthouse Recovery and what they do to, to really not only identify addiction issues and counsel people through it, but bring them all the way back to the core uh, issue that created that trigger of addiction and, and the, the constant cycle of addiction and crime. And then Lighthouse Recovery, because of their work inside the jail, we exit program with them as people return to the community. Not only do they get uh, employment support, uh, job connections, but they also can go directly to Lighthouse Recovery on the outside to continue with their counseling. And then again, back to that lack of opportunities uh, that I pointed out, the third pathway, that's where really all of our job programming comes in. We run OSHA classes, forklift classes, uh, small business, uh, life skills, soft skills training, and again, the job fairs inside of our jail to make sure that people um, have an opportunity when they leave us and we're not just pushing them back out the door only to watch them come back in through the back door, uh, which is where our Sally Port is. And, and I'm really proud of the fact that we've been able to turn these programs inside out. So we're now offering OSHA forklift um, training outside in the community. So the whole point of that is not only is it returning uh, detainees that uh, I should say returning citizens that were detainees coming to take these classes and getting job placement, 
uh, in those trainings, but it's also people from the community. And I believe that that's where law enforcement, public safety really needs to go to start uh, mending a lot of those uh, broken relationships with the lower income communities is to provide opportunities to them, uh, not just while in custody, but out in the community. Um, I'd like to ask a share, um, the sheriff a question. And, and I've taken it from something that one of our um, uh, audience members has presented. As you're doing this work, and um, I certainly applaud that, and we need more, how, as you share your vision and your work with others in similar positions than uh, positions like yours, what is the overriding or give us a, a sense of what your contemporaries are saying as you offer other solutions and other paths? That's a great question. It's, it's very frustrating, I'll be honest with you. So as I pointed out a, a couple of times during this conversation, I've lost friends uh, in the police forces. I've lost friends in the uh, state's attorney's office who are prosecutors because of my very progressive push towards viewing people in custody as, as human beings and individuals. So when we talk about surrounding sheriffs, um, they are a little more progressive in our neighboring counties like DuPage, uh, Tom Dart in Cook County has done a magnificent job implementing programs in the Cook County Jail. Lake County is heading that direction. But as I reach out and I, I, I work through our networks at the Illinois Sheriff's Association, the vast majority of them are incredibly conservative and, and not open to uh, this, this sort of mindset within their correctional facility. Um, they're just not ready for it. Um, to me, that is the frustrating part. Um, to me, we'll continue to set the example because I believe what we do inside the jail here uh, is an example for every jail to follow. And I'm also proud of the fact that we've done all of our programming and all of our work spending zero extra tax dollars. And I know it shouldn't be about money, but we always hear that from police leadership. Well, we just can't afford it. And you know, the, the downstate sheriffs say, we don't have any money in our budget to, to run for. It's a mindset shift. It's empathy. It's you know, doing something just a little bit different um, that then warehousing folks, it's actually caring about folks. So I'm a new sheriff two years into it. Um, I don't expect it to be an easy road, but even if I only do this for one term, I'm going to make count whatever I possibly can. Thank you. Um, there's a question here. Uh, hey, Ron and, and Vince, um, there's still two or three people who are very upset about Ron's flag. And <laughs> I, I don't know what, to, I mean, part of it for me is that there are people who use, who misuse the symbol of the cross. Do we give up the cross because it's misused? How, how, how do you, I don't know. I mean, there, there are some several people who are, there are whole paragraphs about, uh, about the flag with the blue line. Is there anything else to say about that? I mean, I could go on Google and demonize just about every symbol um, known to man in some way, shape, or form that, that has been misused or misappropriated. Um, again, the reason for the blue line flag, should firemen get rid of the red line flag? Should dispatchers get rid of the yellow line flag? Right. Uh, this simply is just a, a symbol of pride in our profession. Uh, it's a wood flag that uh, a good friend of mine made for me when I won the sheriff's election, and it sits on the wall of my office. So maybe if I go like this, is that more comfortable? <laughs> well, somebody, somebody just said, the office is not his. He can take it home and put it in his home office. I, I don't. I don't know. It's well. Look, we live in a fractured time right now, and and this is a this is a a symbol that has been co opted by by a group of people who attempted to overthrow the government and end democracy. So I mean, I get it, um, and we have to recognize uh, recognize that. Um, we also have to um, see that, you know, that that particular symbol has a historic meaning, but we have, right, there are people who stormed the Capitol who had American flags too. Mm -hmm. So we can't get rid of the American, we're not going to get rid of the American flag, but we have to recognize that it too has been co-opted by those who would overthrow 
democracy. And so it's going to raise tensions or it's going to raise questions uh, everywhere and anywhere that it is that it is seen. And that's just where we are right now. And we need to, uh, you know, acknowledge that. I have a question. Though. I deeply respect all of our panelists' opinion. Dr. Gaddis and Dr. Fountain, how do you feel about the, the flag? Is it offensive to you? No, it's not. Um, quite honestly, I saw it, but I have issues in my life that far uh, succeed my concern relative to that. Um, I don't know how else to say it. Racism is real. And it is often um, attempted to be hidden. But and as we look at our institutions, as we look at our communities, as we look at, as has already been mentioned, as we um, still have this mantra of uh, if people want a good life, they should work with it. Well, I got to tell you, as a member of a minority community, it would have been wonderful if the only task I had to do was to um, do the work. Well, why are you here and, and being held suspect? And when I uh, achieved a position, oh, well, she just got that was because she was black. And fortunately, I had a, a, a colleague whose response was, I was on a committee. She got it because she was highly qualified. But that presumption based on my black skin is still very, very real in this community. And we often have people who try to present themselves otherwise, but uh, we see something very different. Um, I've been um, stopped and asked if I live in my community. Well, I have lots of uh, questions, <laughs> lots of thoughts about that. Um, I had a police officer stop me at the intersection of Route 58 and Route 59, which if you're familiar with that is a very dark intersection. It was a Friday night about 8 p.m. And I saw the flashing lights. I knew I wasn't uh, speeding. And um, the police, I pulled over. And the first thing the police officer said to me was, well, what are you, where are you going? Well, I didn't think that was pertinent. And I simply said home. And he asked, well, where are you coming from? Um, didn't think that was pertinent either. But the reality is I'm a black woman at an intersection, a very dark intersection with a gentleman who has a gun, who then starts asking me, how do I like my car? Well, my inclination was, it's none of your business how I like my car, but that extra pressure just because he could. Ultimately, uh, my major offense, and I admit I was wrong, um, the problem was that the sticker that you put on your plate is supposed to be on the back plate instead of the front plate. And I can't imagine that he didn't already know uh, as a result of calling in that my car was registered. Um, but uh, this extra stuff and um, uh, that was, was, was frightening for me um, because the truth is I know that racism has not left us. And that, put that, that officer in that uniform in a dark intersection, I know anything could have happened. Um, and so I, I keep, it, it may sound corny, but I'll tell you what, if we could get rid of those racist attitudes, values and behaviors in our families and in our schools and in our churches, we do know that most of our churches are still racially segregated. Um, I think if we could go down that path, I, 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 I think we could get to the prison system, but all of that reality is still there. Not addressing it does not remove it. Dr. Gaddis, what are you thinking? 
I'm think I'm 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 thinking a million thoughts right now, but I, I want to read a passage from the text that goes to the point Joyce was just mentioning. Um, uh, let me just read for those of you who have the book. This is page 131. The United States v. Bergoni Ponce. Uh, the court concluded it was permissible under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment for the police to use race as a factor in making decisions about which motorists to stop and search. Okay, uh, I'll skip down a little bit. The court's quiet blessing of race-based traffic stops has led to something of an Orwellian public discourse regarding racial profiling. Police departments and highway patrol agencies frequently declare, we do not engage in racial profiling, even though their officers routine, routinely use race as a factor when making decisions regarding whom to stop and search. The justification for the implicit doublespeak, we do not racial profile, we just stop people based on race, can be explained in part by the Supreme Court's jurisprudence. Because the Supreme Court has authorized the police to use race as a factor when making decisions regarding whom to stop and search, police departments believe that racial profiling exists only when race is the sole factor. Thus, if race is one factor, but not the only factor, then it doesn't really count as a factor at all. And so the, the issue is it becomes, as Dr. Fountain just alluded to, right, a DWB situation. And, and part of the issue of this text and part of the answer to your question, and I'm going to kind of circle, try and make a circle to that, is that, um, you know, in terms of mass incarceration, law enforcement's role in mass incarceration, uh, what we do so people don't get into the mass incarceration pipeline is we have to be taking account of the law and the way that the law allows racist policy to work. So, um, so, so we have to, to, to try and change those laws and the way that they are enacted, perceived, or um, moved on, okay? Which is part of why 3653, if we wanna take it home, is important. Every officer ought to have a body camera, right? Uh, you know, every, every off, you know, the chokehold should be banned everywhere. You know, cash bail is, is a discriminatory practice. Okay, those are things. Now, what I wanna to get to that we haven't really talked about, and then I'm gonna answer the, the, the sheriff's question. What 3653 does not talk about is reentry. And one of the most significant things I think in, in dealing with the uh, mass incarceration issue is, is the reentry piece. Um, Sheriff Hain was saying that something, I think you said something like 60% of those who you see are, is, are repeat offenders. I know in Aurora some years ago, 65% uh, of all felony arrests were repeat offenders. So if we could create the kind of real wraparound services that those coming out of incarceration need, and we had real community support to say that people, even though they have a felony record, that I will hire them, I will educate them, I will work with them, then they have hope and the chances of recommitting a crime go down. So um, one of these things is, is ban the box, all of that, that whole movement, which is important. Because if you, um, if you have that felony conviction and a felony conviction means civil death, well, there's really no point in being an active participant, is there? So we, we really need to, to, to work on that. Now, back to uh, Sheriff Haynes, uh, let me answer your, your question very quickly. Right now in this time where that flag 
has been co-opted by um, co-opted by uh, a white nationalist uh, <laughs> racist element in this country that is seditious. Yes, I have a problem with that flag. Really noted, and I can't control ignorance. Um, but again, what I strive is for balance. So you know what I advocate for. You know what my work looks like on a daily basis, and yes, I know what flag stands for. So which is which is why when which is why when this call started, I didn't hang up uh, because because like all symbols, we must understand the context of the symbol, but we also have to recognize that. Uh, one symbol may have a particular meaning at a particular time to an individual. I understand your understanding of that flag, okay? Um, and it's and the historical reality of the symbol. We need to recognize and recognize. See, people, this is our problem in this country. We can't hold two things in our head at the same time. Can we hold in our head? that historically the police have used this symbol to recognize the importance of originally of officers who had fallen in the line of duty. Can we hold that in our head and at the same time recognize that this symbol in our most recent past, like I'm talking in the last year, has been co-opted by a certain element of the population. Now, our job shouldn't be to get pissed off at the flag. Our, what we ought to be doing is getting pissed off at the people who co-opted the symbol. Okay, I'm done with that. <laughs> Preach it, brother. <laughs> uh, there's a question here um, that, that hasn't been answered. And it says, how do we understand when the system needs changing and is defective Yet we have those like Sheriff Hain who are trying to make change for positive and d deserve our support. It's those two things. I mean, there's there there are negatives that need to be changed, and there are people who working for change. How how do we how do we recognize and affirm both of those things? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I was reading, I was, I was trying to read the questions and the yeah, chats and all of that. I I'm sorry. You know how the Zoom thing can go, I, right? I know, I know. It, <laughs> but it, I was it, not, but I, but I assure you, I was not texting while the meeting was going that's on. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Dr. Gaddis, it's all right. It's a question from Marjorie Logman, and she says this. How do we understand when the system needs changing and is defective? Yet we have those like Sheriff Hain who are trying to make change for the positive and deserve our support. It's that both end thing. Yes, things are not right, and yes, we're working on change. How do you, how do you, how do we live in that world? I think that's what she's asking. Yeah, well, we have to, uh, well, we're kind of far afield from the book, but that's okay, because that's a key question. You know, look, there are people who are trying to do good in this world. Can we recognize that? And to the degree that, it, that Sheriff Hain is doing the things that he believes bring, uh, accelerate and, and are good for diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and, and, and preparing people to, to, to be productive members of society, we should say yes, it's a good idea that people in the jail are able to get job experience so that when they get out, maybe they can get a job with an employer that he's working with. We should applaud those efforts. We must applaud those efforts. And at the same time, we have to recognize that, in, uh, that Sheriff Hain is also working within a larger context of law enforcement, within a larger context of mass incarceration, which, which also need to be addressed and dealt with. So, so um, we, we have to become, I, and this is just my general comment, uh, whatever. Look, people, we have to get to a place where we can start critically thinking. Can we say that a sheriff 
can do what he thinks will help so prisoners don't come back to the Kane County Jail. Yes, can we acknowledge that that happens, that he is part of a larger system where the attitude is not shared that he shares? We, ha we, have, to, we have to start recognizing that there are there is such a thing called an ally, but we cannot get mesmerized, as Dr. King said, into thinking that ally means a white liberal who says, well, I want you to get free on my timeline, right? But when we see people, I mean, look, I was so encouraged back in the summer where there were people of all different races, ages, SES, fighting, arguing for, marching for uh, civil rights. Okay, we need to do that. We need to be able to acknowledge where people are doing good. And we have to also acknowledge we're in a system that needs to be um, changed, right? That we need a revolution in values. There's no doubt in my mind. So it's a both and question. It's a both and. We have to start being able to hold two things in our minds. We have to recognize we live in a racist system, in a racist society that there are allies who want to work for freedom and that if we need want to change this system, at some point there's got to be a critical mass of enough people who can't only be Black to actually make changes that are anti-racist to the system. Yeah. I see you're shaking your head, Ron. I'm nodding my head. Yes, for sure. <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, there is you're right, Ron. <laughs> back to back to Dr. Fountain um, with uh, you know how she felt when she was pulled over at 58 and 59, and you know how she felt you know subjected to that police officer. That that breaks my heart, and it's very symbolic. And that's why it's it's so important for me. Again, back to that balance. It's so important for me. And like Dr. Gaddis said, there have to be enough non-idiots, critically thinking people who are empathetic, who are willing, that, are, that aren't black, who are willing to stand up and say enough is enough. And this is how we recraft uh, a, a system that features racial disparity. And that's why I am very proud to wear this wherever I go and wave that flag because I have to represent law enforcement. And I have to be that balance that says, look, you know, Yes, drugs have a, a big impact on violent crime here in Kane County, but when I walk through my jail and I see the racial disparity, I am not afraid to lose friends. I'm not afraid to go uh, against the grain and walk into a courtroom and, and tell the prosecutors and the police officers uh, that they're not right on this one and trying to give an exorbitant sentence to a black man uh, just because of his criminal history throughout two or three decades. Um, we have to, and I saw one of the comments, stop treating people like animals and start treating them like humans. Stop treating people like numbers, which is how our justice system works and treat them like human beings. Yeah. And we all get this done together. And it is critical, like Dr. Gaddis said, to have people that look and wear a uniform like me to, to pound that message on a daily basis. There are, two, there are two questions that are similar, but they're a little bit different. Um, Sharon Sperlin asks, when various white supremacy groups started to connect via the internet around 1985, they decided to look more mainstream and to get on church boards, city councils, police forces, etc. If they've infiltrated police structures and police forces, how do the police know if that has happened and what can be done about this? And then a similar question, there have been studies that confirm that there's a rise in white supremacists in law enforcement around across the country. How do you weed these individuals out from the sheriff's office or other law, law enforcement organizations and applications to join it? Uh, what is, how, how is, how are you working on that, Ron, in, in terms of the, the sheriff's department? Sure, just a brief answer on that. It's all about dashboarding in modern law enforcement. And by dashboarding, I mean, of course, now we have digital data that we can use on a daily basis to keep track of our staff. Who are they stopping? Uh, Illinois created the racial profiling law back in, I think it was 2009, 2010, that requires an every single contact, uh, every single traffic stop on the backside of every warning and on the backside of every ticket 
is a racial profiling data form that we have to fill out. And it simply records uh, the race of the person, the sex of the person, uh, what the reason for the stop was, and uh, if a search was conducted. And I think that's critical data to have to truly uh, track what your officers are doing out there. And that was one of the things, like I mentioned having a hard time getting through chapter two of the book before. Um, when, when I compare our annual stop data to demographics in Kane County, I'm incredibly proud to see that we are directly on track with our 57% white, 6% black. Um, our traffic stop data reflects that completely when it comes to uh, searches, our traffic stop data reflects that equally as well. So when I talk about our professional deputies out there on the street, um, that gives us that, that background to say, um, we're heading in the right direction. Now, to combat issues of racism or um, negative impact, like Dr. Fountain felt like she had on that one traffic stop, we strongly encourage people to complain to us <laughs> about our officers. We have complaint forms online, canesheriff.com. If you have a negative interaction, you're always welcome to call the sheriff's office and, and lodge a complaint. Uh, and we always appreciate the compliments too uh, against our deputies. And we have an office of professional standards that investigates those complaints. And of course, since all of our interactions are now recorded on dash and body cam here at the sheriff's office, we do have that backup to be able to, to thoroughly review, I won't call it the confrontation, the interaction uh, under question and come to a legitimate professional decision and discipline if necessary. There's a, a question here um, from Kevin Joshua, and I, I'm going to ask it a, in a slightly different way. He says, would you advocate in defunding the EPD in order to invest in other sectors that could reduce crime? Um, Sheriff Hain is not with the EPD. He's with the Sheriff's Department. But one of the big concerns these days is the reappropriation of funding so that there's more money in mental health, more money in the areas um, that, that you've talked about. What, what, um, what is your response to that, both Vince and Ron and, and even Joyce? Even Joyce? <laughs> yes, Joyce. I'm sure you have something to say. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I'll, I guess I'll briefly speak to it first, which is um, I'm, I'm going to take this from two approaches. Uh, I hosted a forum several weeks ago. Uh, and had some members from the uh, Illinois uh, Chief of Police Association. Uh, one of them, Mitchell Davis, who's the chief in Hazelcrest and is the vice president of the organization said this, which I agree with in, in part. Part of the issue is not defunding police and I'm gonna don't just everybody be cool I'm coming there but refunding state funding for mental health for uh, these other programming for education so we need to look at this defund the police and say we need more funding for social services, after school programs, uh, reading, um, you know, reading literacy programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I also think that looking at police budgets, that allowing the police to buy on the cheap military equipment to why to you know weaponizing militarizing our police forces does not do anything to really help us in terms of building community police relations when you're dealing with a police force that looks more like an occupying army than a police force so so um i do believe that things like um allowing uh, police departments to buy uh, military equipment on the cheap based on drug um, drug busts and then the proceeds of that being used to, to pay for military equipment. I think that needs to go down. We need to embed within police departments mental health workers, right? Um, so that when that officer goes to someone's home and Jimmy is off of his meds, that that uh, that you need an officer there 
right? Jimmy might be violent. We need an officer there who's trained in de-escalation, but we need a mental health professional there to help Jimmy get to the hospital. And then while Jimmy is on his 72 hour hold or whatever they have, put in place the follow up so that Jimmy, when he gets out, has somewhere to go. So Jimmy will be on his meds. And, and this is part of the defund equation for me is putting more resources in the hands of the police in, the, in terms of mental health professionals who are not just add-ons that, that are there to work with only officers, which is needed, but also that we have mental health professionals that can, that can be part of, of, of helping the mental health services of those uh, on those kinds of calls, because that is one of the leading uh, number volume of calls that officers get dispatched to are mental health crisis situations. So we need to be able to deal with that in a way that is more effective than send an officer arrest the person and take them to jail. We, we need to rethink what we mean by public safety. Uh, and so reimagining how we fund it is also important. Uh, Ron, any, any response? Dr. Bond, I wanted to give you the floor too. <laughs> you know, that's awesome. I feel like I cut you off. <laughs> no, 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 you did not cut me off. Please go ahead. Okay. so. Again, back to balance. Uh, when we talk about defunding EPD um, or refunding EPD, Elgin Police Department is one of the most progressive police agencies that I know of. And I, I used to teach law enforcement across the country before I came, became the sheriff. Um, it, they led the way locally with their social worker program that accompanies their, their law enforcement uh, division. So obviously they have social workers that go out and they, they mitigate calls right alongside uh, or in follow-up to the officers that respond to preserve safety in the first place. Um, we are going that direction at the sheriff's office here. I hired a social worker uh, two months ago and she's already at over 70 cases that have been forwarded to her. So obviously we're gonna have to expand that division here at the sheriff's office. Refunding the police, redirecting where we go. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, when it comes to our LESO program and it, it's that's where we get military equipment uh, it's actually not even on the cheap, Dr. Gaddis, it's free. Uh, but uh, the majority of what we get is equipment for our jobs programs and our jobs training uh, in the jail. Uh, it's office equipment. We've gotten three forklifts to help with our forklift classes. Um, but yes, we did get an armored vehicle uh, that is bulletproof. And of course, if everybody remembers before COVID, uh, we had active shooters, and that was a huge concern to the community. Now, I believe there's a time and a place for an armored vehicle. Uh, we use our armored vehicle for rescues. So we, we use them for officer down rescues and citizen rescues. So if we have to get into an area where there's active gunfire, uh, we will deploy that vehicle, and obviously we can get in and out without uh, any further harm to people. However, I'll give the example of my predecessor used to put those armored vehicles in parades. I feel like that is highly inappropriate. Uh, when I became sheriff, I immediately revoked that practice of allowing our armored vehicles to be paraded down the streets uh, of our communities like, like it's something to be proud of. If we have to use those vehicles, we are not in a moment, Kane County, that we should be proud of. Um, in the June protests uh, in Aurora, uh, our two armored vehicles took gunshots to the front windshield. And if we didn't have them, I would have two funerals for deputies. Uh, so I do believe in them. Um, it allows law enforcement agencies to, to safeguard themselves and their citizens, um, but we do not use them in a militaristic fashion. And I, I do not regard any portion of the sheriff's office as, as a militarized unit. Joyce, before you speak, somebody is asking um, the mayor to speak on this also. So Joyce, do you have a, a, something to say about this? And then maybe if uh, Mayor Captain could you, come back. Why don't you let the mayor speak? Okay. Dave, are you there? I'm there coming back is. and a couple of things, you know, and I, and I wish people, uh, when they comment, I wish they would uh, ask the Elgin Police Department or ask for information first. I saw one comment about raising the budget $3 million. Uh, the vast majority of that 
was uh, is mandated by state law and requ for uh, required pension contributions. It's got nothing to do with adding uh, more police officers. And I've spoken for a number of years and I see Denise Haven on here. This goes back seven or eight years for me. I said, the state was gonna let us down and the state let us down by not funding exactly the types of things we're talking about, mental health, and the burden started to fall back on local police department and local government to do that. So we did increase. We did increase the number of people that we have in the police department because those issues uh, have now manifested themselves. Drugs as well. You know, and we're doing a good job. And I think one of the things that instead of looking at defunding, how do we fund this properly? If, the, if this is going to become a burden for um, uh, the Elgin Police Department to do drug interventions, also go out to schools and meet with kids. If you want to defund us, what would you like to leave out? And we'll change that. But you have to pay for the things that the services that you provide. And we are looking at, uh, uh, we've increased the number of people that we do as uh, um, we do with uh, uh, drug interventions. We increased the number of uh, uh, people that are, uh, uh, you, I guess you could call them triage and going out now with mental health. And we contract that through Ecker as, and we bring in professionals. And I said, let's let professionals do the professional job and not ask a police officer to become a psychologist when he's out there on the job. Let's bring the right people in to do these things. But I think those are some of the things that you need to ask these kind of questions and be fair about this. If there is a need to do more uh, intervention from a psychological standpoint, we can do that. We also talk about uh, doing intervention with homeless people. And that is another major issue here. Many of our calls are for uh, people that are homeless. They have drug issues, they have mental issues, uh, alcoholism. We go out to the same people day in and day out. Does it take a police officer to go out there to, to help them uh, get up off the, uh, the sidewalk? Uh, no, it does not. But do they need help after that? What we do is pick them up and then we help them find out where they need to go to get the help that they really need. That's what we do. Uh, Joanne Stingley does that, works full time. Uh, we have people within the uh, police department that do this. Uh, if you ask police to do more, defunding is not going to be the answer to do it. I agree with Dr. Gaddis. I agree with, with uh, Sheriff uh, Hain that the money has to be spent at the top. If we're going to do these things, we've got to do that from the state level and from funding those agencies locally. There are several comments where people are saying, let's reimagine and pay for public safety. Let's figure out you know, all the areas that need funding and, and just expand the funding to meet the need. So I think, I think that there are people who are agreeing with you. Um, we're getting to the end of our time. Um, Joyce, any, any last words before we turn it back to Tish? Um, only I'm gonna reiterate what I've said because, um, well, I'll just say it. Race and racism is real in this society. Um, and somehow many people feel that they somehow have been able to duck all the ways in which the culture perpetuates racism. So one of the things that I think is helpful and I always encourage my students with the line, think about what you think about. And when you think of a white person, what do you think? When you think of an Asian person, what do you think? And what that does is that allows us to discover our own biases, even while we're saying, oh no, you know, I'm an equal opportunity employer or a thinker or whatever. And the other thing I would really stress is parents and adults, you are setting the pattern. You are, we teach our children both directly and indirectly. What kids come to your friends, to your child's home? Who do they hang out uh, with? I've had students say their parents would not allow them to. And so the, again, this idea of the values and the attitudes that we um, learn and then follow regarding the other. 
unless we get to that, even in some of these very important areas that have been discussed, well, it depends on if the funding will go through based on what the values and beliefs of the one who writes the check. And so they're interrelated. All of this is interrelated and, and we have to work through all of them. Um, thank you, Mayor Captain. Thank you, Sheriff Hain. Thank you, Dr. Gaddis. Thank you, Joyce Fountain. Tish, are you there? Can you come back and um, give us the final kind of, um, blessing and benediction. <laughs> well, first of all, I wanna thank all of you for attending. We had a total of 114 people. So 114 people to give up uh, whatever sports ball playoff is going on right now and participate in this conversation, which is extremely, extremely valuable and important, I think is a, a testament to our community and who all of you are and we have a common goal to work towards. And it might not seem that sitting around talking does very much. I know there have been calls to action, but you have no idea how important it is just to build those relationships by talking to one another. So I want to um, give a call out to uh, Dr. Vincent Gaddis and Study Circles Elgin. Those are going to be starting up. So please go to studycircleselgin.org for more information and to register. Also, I want to uh, tell you about our next discussion, which will be Sunday, April 18th, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And it will be uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me. And it's a long letter to his adolescent son about the, the state of the world and um, his thoughts and feelings, experiences as a black man. And here is Tana Hasey right there. So that his work for uh, the Atlantic is required reading, folks. Yeah. Hey, Tanish, um, we've had several people who want to know how they get the tape of this. We have recorded. Yes. We we could not record the last one because we, uh, Debbie Irving um, w did not want us to record. But yeah, we didn't have permission for that one. This, this will be recorded, and and go ahead. Uh, I believe that the um, recording will be available on our YouTube channel, which is where we archive most of our library programs. So that will go up probably sometime this week. Uh, we just need to do a little bit of um, production on it to get it ready for uploading. So if anybody is interested, feel free to email me if you would like individual notification. And that's tcalamer at gailboarding.info. My first initial uh, last name, it's in the chat box or I'm going to be posting a notification on the Facebook event page for this event. And uh, if, if I figure out any other ways of notifying everybody, I, you'll see it. So uh, in closing, thank you to Denise Tracy, Joyce Fountain, Mayor Dave Captain, Sheriff Ron Hain, and Dr. Vincent Gannett, and all of you for joining us on this cold wintry day uh, for a very lively and deep delving conversation on the topic of racism, so important for all of us to join together and do the work. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Have a great day. You Everybody too. stay safe.